All right. Uh, thanks a lot first for having me today and uh, giving, me, giving me the opportunity to talk a little bit about my work. Um, it's great actually that we have seen so many young speakers, especially. So it's great to see a lot of uh, exciting new stuff. And uh, yeah, thanks to organizers for that. I think it's very great what we have heard so far. So my talk is essentially a continuation of Rafael's talk in the morning. I'm going to give you some more details, um, point out a few funny features and interesting uh, things we discovered during the competition. And then I'm going to focus mostly um, on our path to 4 p.m. So um, you saw this diagram with this graphics uh, at the end of Rafael's talk, and I'm going to follow up pretty much what he's been doing. So I'm going to try to explain to you how we can use this uh, post minkowskian effective field theory to compute uh, the deflection angle, and then also briefly a little bit uh, about how we then continue that to learn a lot about uh, the bound problem, just from computing uh, the scattering angle. I'm not going to talk about a lot about the amplitude story, but what I want to point out at the end is some funny features, this fears of formula that also Raphael mentioned, um, which well, where we can play quite a lot of uh, funny games. So, where do we stand? Right now, um, we are at the third post Minkowskian order. That means the third order uh, in chi, the gravitational uh, coupling, uh, computing the scattering angle. I'm only talking about the conservative part, and we're only considering here uh, the exchange of potential gravitons. So we've already seen this result. It has been checked uh, by several groups by now. And uh, I think we can pretty much be sure that that's what it should be. Uh, maybe just something small to point out here that's interesting. So I've written in this form that actually Dabmur proposed that we can see here that this, uh, this gamma factor is popping up, which is defined down here. That in principle, if you knew uh, the, the, the first self force limit, so at order new, you know the complete result. So this is something very nice that we immediately see here uh, in this form, but just to point out. But what can you do with this uh, scattering angle? We can use uh, this analytic continuation that you heard about a lot uh, from Raphael. So I'm gonna swap from a B space, so from impact parameter space to angular momentum space. And I'm simply going to plug this, this chi b's, the Bernoulli chi j's, into my master formula, and I'll get my radial action. So through that, I can immediately reuse uh, the scattering angle for whatever I want in the bound problem. Okay. Also, we know, already know a few things about this chi b4. So that's my main quantity I want to study today, because that's where we want to go, right? We want the 4 p.m. scattering angle. We already know the Schwarzschild limit. That means the limit where one of the bodies is a really heavy black hole. And essentially, there's just a test particle going around it or scattering with it, essentially going along, uh, along the geodesic. Okay. Also, additionally, a lot of PN data. I'm just showing you here the current state of the art at 6 PN. Um, it's actually a bit more complicated than I'm showing here. But essentially, this is just how this uh, results in look. OK, so our strategy to get to this chi b is via this uh, post Mikowski EFT. So I'm just going to summarize a little bit or the rest of the in the morning and point out uh, some more details. So first of all, what I really want to, to emphasize is that this is purely classical and it's a very systematic approach. We essentially know how we can also embed finite size effects, how we can use spin and so on. And uh, there's some uh, results to be expected as Rafael also other, other tries from his group uh, about spin effects. What I want to focus is on uh, this perturbative expansion in chi, because there's a lot of uh, amplitudes and other methods for particle physics that we can use. So I'm going to show you how we explicitly do that. So my setup is the same. I'm going to have an Einstein-Hilbert action. I'm going to couple some word line uh, point particle to it. Again, I'm going to use uh, this Polyakov type of action. So that's very nice because the graviton only couples uh, to my sources, so to my two word lines in a linear fashion. So it's just essentially a one point function. And then you can add whatever you want, finite size effects, a spin, and so on. The first thing I want to do is to integrate out the graviton. So for, from a quantum field theory point of view, I want to perform uh, this integral here. Um, I will only do, actually, the, I will only integrate at the potential modes. So I will never allow uh, these guys here, these uh, intermediate uh, gravitons, to be on shell. And I treat the external uh, the world lines just as static sources. At the end of the day, I will compute an object like that. For that, we used uh, ancient technology and we used Feynman uh, rules. You might not tell me, OK, Feynman rules in gravity, that's something you really don't want to do. It's disgusting, and it just explodes in your head. But to that, well, there's a few things. First of all, it can be very clever. You can choose uh, some very nice cage fixing terms. You can add total derivatives. And you could even do some fielder definitions. And what you find that it's actually not too bad. 
So at 3 p.m., we're going to need a four point, uh, a four point Lagrangian, so a four point coupling of um, four gravitons. And you can find a form that only has 18 terms. If you allow for field that are definitions, you could even bring it down to 12 terms. So that's really not that much. Of course, you can still uh, symmetrize to get your Feynman rules out of it, but still, any modern PC can do it. Maybe to give you an idea, um, this whole computation at two loops, the 3 p.m. computation, can essentially be done on my mobile phone. It's, it has the same computing power as my laptop, and from the start to the end, you can really do it there. So you can do the integrand, you can compute all the integrals, everything. So this really is not a problem. Also at uh, five point, so at 4 p.m., which is the three loop level, um, it's not a problem. It's not a lot of terms. You just plug into your PC. It's powerful enough to just do it overnight, and you can get your whole integrand. Um, maybe just a short comment here. We are not using fielder definitions because we do not want to screw up this linear coupling to the word line, but it might actually be useful to do it once you think about finite size effects and spin, because then either way you will have this, um, this two point or higher point word line coupling. So maybe that's a, a something in the future we might have to think about. So after I've computed uh, my effective Lagrangian, so I'm gonna just write it down in a PM expansion in part of G, I cannot solve uh, the equations of motions, as already uh, Raphael told you about. So here I'm going to just expand around uh, some in the impact parameter, so where it starts from, and then you have some incoming uh, particles with u1 and u2, and then just expand to higher order. A comment here is maybe that we're doing that purely symbolically, so I'm not going to perform any integrals except some trivial uh, delta function integrals, or depending how you solve these equations of motion, you have to integrate that, of course, uh, over all time, or you can do it in Fourier space, so however you to do it, it's either very simple integrals or we don't perform them and just do it purely symbolically. Because what I actually want to compute is the scattering angle or in other language, different languages, deflection of this word line. For that, what I need to do is to integrate over all times um, my effective Lagrangian that I just computed before. Here again, we can do some counting, but I of course have to do a way to reinsert uh, my trajectory that I just computed before into this Lagrangian. So if you think about that, my uh, Lagrangian, the first uh, uh, the, the 1 p.m. Lagrangian will come with one order of g. Uh, to get to actually g cubed, I can insert up to the second order in my word line. So this gives greater, of course, again, g cubed. For my second order Lagrangian, of course, I only have to insert up to the first order in my uh, trajectory. Again, gives uh, together three powers of g. And finally, of course, my uh, third order Lagrangian, I only need to um, evaluate at the linear order. So only if I have a straight line uh, shooting through. And the same story, of course, holds at 4 p.m., but the same pattern uh, continues. At the end of the day, if you do that, you're going to get your trajectory, which you then can simply uh, extract the scattering angle from. So this is my setup. I'm really using an orthogonal impact parameter here, and I'm computing this angle, this physical scattering angle in a conservative region uh, but I only allow for potential gravitons. Of course, this is not as simple as it might look because there's a quite a lot of difficult integrals that one has to do. Uh, maybe first to comment exactly um, that the same integrand that I computed here can also be uh, derived in a slightly different way. And I believe that Gustav just after me will talk a little bit about that, by treating also the world lines as that dynamical degrees of freedom, and since you're also getting Feynman rules uh, for these uh, guys propagating. So the generic structure that you will find that your integrals have uh, looks like here. So first of all, we will have a Fourier transform, which actually is only two dimensional. So it's uh, orthogonal to this U1 and U2 direction of my incoming particles. And uh, this is actually very simple to perform as I'll tell you afterwards. And it's indeed actually just a two dimensional uh, integral if we consider uh, the four dimensional theory. The hard part are these Feynman integrals here. They don't have some very uh, specific properties for us. So what happens is that you always have a single uh, delta function per loop momentum. So something like L dot U. This happens all the time. We only have these kind of integrals for, for our, our whole integrand. And this will help us a lot in what comes afterwards. Um, furthermore, we have these linear propagators here with some different uh, I0 prescriptions. And of course, the usual uh, squared type of propagators like L squared, L minus Q, Q squared, and so on. Um, so the upshot here is that we only find a subset of the integrals that, for example, uh, Sweden Company have found, 
or also for the N equals eight, uh, Julio and company have found. Maybe we should also mention that uh, already Carlo, uh, Gabriele, Julio and uh, Michael talked about that. And we directly land on the soft classical integrals. So we immediately have these linear propagators and we only have what they call this cut H family, at least at 3 p.m. So in total, uh, we found that there we have around 876 integrals at two loop order, so 3 p.m. and around 80,000 at 4 p.m. So it looks maybe bad, but of course, there's a lot of technology that will help us actually bring this number down. So what we did was uh, to consider integration by part relations. And uh, this is pretty much standard by now. We already heard a few talks that mentioned it. Um, I'm gonna just pick out some uh, important properties that help us. Uh, maybe just first, first, let me mention a few things here. Um, most of this, uh, the, the most common algorithm is by Laporta and it's actually implemented in a lot of packages. I'm not sure if I uh, put down all of them here. We actually have used uh, light thread and fire which was a very convenient setup because Lightroad helps you to so, find symmetries and fire is very efficiently implemented in C++ and helps us to do this reduction. Then today you, so the IBP is essentially a big system of linear relations between all my integrals here and we simply then reduce it to a set of master integrals. Um, something that helped us a lot were again these delta functions that I just mentioned before. Because also those guys, we are, let's say reverse unitarity, you can also see them as linear propagators. Essentially the exponent of these delta functions is uh, a derivative, right? But what happens if you have a negative power delta functions, uh, these integrals actually vanish. So you can simply ignore them and throw them away. That's actually a very nice mechanism in light and fire, how it can be implemented. And if you're interested, yeah, well, maybe just send me a private message somewhere and I can explain it to you. This gave us a significant speed up and really allowed us uh, to essentially run the whole 4 p.m. Uh, integration by parts reduction overnight on just a normal uh, personal computer. So when you do that, uh, for the 3 p.m. problem, we found seven master integrals uh, without linear propagators and two that actually included uh, these linear propagators that I showed before. And at 4 p.m., where we stand is that we brought it down to around 150 masters so far. But also there, we know that this is just an upper limit because we already have found some symmetries that we missed by hand. And we hope that we can somehow improve on that and print this number even further down. So this step, uh, the only thing we need to do to complete our computation is to compute these master integrals, of course. And um, we already heard a little bit about that in the previous talks. And so what worked very nicely at 3 p.m. was this idea of having differential equations. So what do we, what was actually done in this very nice paper by Julio, Michael, and Mao was that I, um, the first of all, used this parameter x instead of uh, gamma, so essentially just uh, the energy, or u1 or u2, and to take your master integrals, take the derivative with respect to x, you IBP reduce again your result, and you get this linear system of differential equations. Uh, using some uh, technology by hand and company, uh, you can bring it actually into very nice form. You can find a so-called canonical basis, which essentially means that you make the epsilon dependence of this matrix here trivial, which allows you then in turn to solve this uh, differential equations order by order in epsilon, and everything is very simple. So at 3 p.m. this worked very nicely, and you were able to actually reproduce the results, even though um, it would not have even been necessary because they gave us all the integrals that we needed essentially. So. The only thing missing at this point are boundary conditions. And also there, it's very convenient to have these delta functions around because once more, you can go to a static limit, you can choose some frame where you put your u1 and u2 and your uh, integrals are just reduced to 3D integrals. Uh, these integrals were already familiar to us or at least to Raphael coming from the PN EFT side, the post Newtonian expansion where you do exactly this type of static integrals uh, for small velocity and we were recently just able to take them from there, plug them in and get our result out. So at the end of the day, um, you're left with just a simple Fourier transform. Also here, there's some tricks that are uh, worth mentioning. So for example, um, there's only three directions in our problem. We have Q, the momentum exchange between the two world lines. You have the U1 and U2 directions of the two world lines. It turns out that the U1 and U2 direction can be bootstrapped directly from lower orders uh, via this on-shell condition. 
But this, of course, only works in the conservative sector. But since that's what we consider at the moment, this works perfectly fine. So there's only the Q direction left. And also for that one, there's a neat trick because you can essentially write as T2 dB, so a derivative with respect to the impact parameter, um, because it only appears up here in my exponential. So at this point, it already looks a little bit actually like the iconal form, because what I have, I'll have a d minus two dimensional integrals, if this delta functions here, and outside I will have a d to db. We know that it's not exactly the iconal, because this is actually not the iconal impact parameter, but it's orthogonal impact parameter, but still, it seems to essentially contain the same amount of theta as the iconal uh, would do. So this seems to be a very interesting uh, connection that you probably should uh, look at a little bit closer. And I believe also Gustav might say a few words about that just, just after me. Okay, so this works pretty nicely at 3 p.m. And we believe that actually also at 4 p.m. we can do quite a lot of things. So this is uh, ongoing work uh, with Cheng and you, uh, Gustav Mokul and Rafael Porto. And so essentially to report where we stand right now, we have computed, let's just show you a very simple uh, Five point uh, Feynman rules. We computed the whole integrand. We mapped to two basic integral families. That's everything that we needed, of this, just of this cut form that I showed you before. We performed the IP reductions. We found a lot of symmetries. And right now we are at the last step. So that means we need to solve somehow this master. We need to find these master integrals. We're essentially trying really hard to solve the differential equations. But also there, there's not a unique way how to do it. We can just try to directly solve them. Maybe for a subset of them, we can just guess the answer or actually solve it. Um, we can throw a lot of these nice packages that try to find its uh, canonical form onto it, see if any of them manages to find it. Or we can just also try to do, play around with numerics and reconstruct it at the end of the day. Also in the boundary conditions, we start thinking about it. And it actually turns out that masters without linear propagators are quite simple to compute. Those are simply static 3D integrals at three loops. And it seems like we can easily compute most of them. Also, it seems like the symmetrization trick that has been used by many people before us uh, can be played again if you have linear propagators downstairs. And at the end of the day, you will end up with only 2D integrals for these type of guys. So this seems to be really no problem at this point. So what I try to convince you here is that 4 p.m. does not seem as hard anymore, and I believe we can get there pretty soon. Okay, so for the end of my talk, I'm gonna slightly swap gears a little bit because I want to talk a little bit more about this analytic continuation. If you actually paid attention uh, in Rafa's talk or in the start here, you might have realized that only even coefficients of chi appear in my master formula for the radial action. You might now ask, well, it does 3 p.m. not play a role at all? Can I forget about chi 3? And the answer is no, you cannot. And how you can see that is by looking at this first formula, which will be at the heart of all this whole story, which is actually quite nice. Um, but okay, to explain that, let me do a short detour. I want to consider uh, this momentum, the center of mass frame along the trajectory. So it's simply uh, the inverse of my Hamiltonian, my conserved Hamiltonian. So first off gave us this relation here between this momentum and the scattering angle. What we managed to do, so that was Rafael and me uh, a year ago, was to essentially solve this equation in a PM setup to all orders. So we can find some uh, relation between the PM coefficients of this uh, momentum and the PM coefficients of the scattering angle. So it doesn't really matter how this looks. This is simply a combinatorial formula. You can plug it in and you can do it to all orders. So this is pretty nice. What you can do now is the following game. Let's now say, start from our formula that we had before for the radial action. What I can do now, instead of expressing it in terms of the scattering angle, I can express it in terms of this f, so these coefficients of my uh, momentum in the center of mass frame. Of course, this is simply the chi2, this is simply chi4. But if you now go back, so use this identity again, so you invert this relation, you can in turn now once more express these f's in terms of chi's. What will happen now here, we don't know the f4 because we don't know chi4, so we can simply forget about it for a moment and simply plug in here uh, my f2s, f1 and f3. But of course now f3 will contain the chi3 and that's exactly how the information from chi3 propagates into the bound case, into this radial action. 
And it's necessary to put it there if we, for example, want to reconstruct the 2PN answer that Raphael briefly uh, flashed uh, in the previous session before. So that's a very nice story, where actually Fearsoft uh, really allows us to understand this bound mapping a lot better. And it's just a very funny story that it happens in that way. Um, okay, but before I'm completely out of time, there's another very funny story where you can use this Fearsoft formula, which Better, is for five minutes left, including discussion. So. Oh. Okay. But that includes discussion. Um, Note that. Yeah. Yes, yes. I'm almost done. It's my second to last slide. So um, if let's say you truncate your theory, your FM theory or your amplitude theory, because we know that the amplitude and this FM are essentially the same thing, you can resum because even at chi 10,000, this, uh, this chi coefficients, all of them depend on F1 and F2 and F3. This is an all order relation. So what you can do, you can resum contributions at all orders in chi. And you can, for example, find this arcus tau here. Or you can do it even for F1, F2 theory, just say F3 and up are zero, and you can find this guy here. The problem is it becomes very hard. We weren't able to do the F1, 2, 3 theory for the scattering angle. We though resumed some parts of the periastron advance of the radial action and even some of these uh, orbital elements. So I think this is a very nice story. And all of this heavily relies on this fears of formula. So this is something that we really should do have more work on. All right, let me conclude. I really hope that I uh, convinced you that we have built here a very systematic approach. We have a very efficient setup to study the two-body problem. It really needs full beauty. We have a lot of, uh, exactly we can do finite size effects, spin, and we really can directly aim for the part we want, the classical part, or whatever we're interested in. Um, of course, the hard part is the integration, but we made a lot of new friends and hope to make a lot of new friends in the future that will help us uh, do that. There's a lot of cool technology out there that will really help us uh, to get uh, 4 p.m. done. I also hope that we'll make more contact with the iconal to understand it better, because all that might help us to somehow smoothen our whole setup, that we don't need to do uh, compute this U1 and U2 contribution. We directly can go for really the minimal information. And finally, um, I discussed a little bit about this Fierce of Formula, which really allows us to play some neat games. And it also looks that it will be useful in the future to do the analytic continuation if you talk about radiation or radiation reaction. Okay, I think I'll stop and thank you. Okay, thanks, Gregor. Nice talk. Uh, anyone have questions? Okay, I'll, I'll ask a question before, uh, while people are still deciding on their questions. Um, any idea, I mean, I guess based on your slide, the answer is no, but I'm gonna ask anyway, any idea on what the space of functions are, like arc change, whatever? Uh, no. Yeah, it's a good question. We cannot tell at this point. We don't know much yet. So we are starting it. Of course, if someone hands us the, uh, the symbol letters, we would be very happy because then it would probably be very simple. We could use something like initial and just uh, go through for a canonical system. But at this point, we really don't know what you have to plug in. And what we'll hopefully see very soon what's going to happen. But yeah, it's uh, a very Josh has, oh, I agree. Sorry. Josh has a question. Yeah, um, yeah, thanks again for the great talk. Okay. Um, so I'm just wondering for the resummation part. Um, so when you sum over F1, F2, are you able to see some non perturbative effect, like for example, the photon gain? Um, not really, no. This is really just uh, a resummation of, this, uh, of the perturbative series. So we essentially just get um, a part of the full series. So essentially, what but you can also see them that these are parts that in turn would somehow enter in the higher chi. So at higher orders in the scattering angle, um, these terms would actually then enter in there. So essentially what it is, well, somehow you can see it is that we um, get part of the information. And let's say if you think in the PN, the post-Newtonian uh, framework, we essentially compute some of the PN information that we know uh, to all orders and plug it in there. So that's one way of seeing it. It's a little bit more than just PN information, but essentially that's what it turns out to be. It's just a contribution to the chi's that we already know at this order. Right, but um, some are you able to see whether um, is there any divergence or like the convergence of the series that once you resum in this uh, resum form? Sorry, can you say that again? Um, can you see anything like, uh, for example, when the scattering angle becomes like, um, half pi, 90 degree, then it's a, it's a signal about something non-perturbative going on. 
We have not seen anything like that, no. It doesn't seem to happen. Okay, thanks.